Amen. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 17, I will read from the word of the Lord today. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 17. <clears throat> Heard the story of a, an older gentleman that lived out in the mountains of one of the eastern states. He hadn't been to town in a long time. This was several years ago. Finally, he hooked, he hooked old Betsy, his only mule, up to a wagon. And uh, said, got to go into town and get some supplies. So he came off of the dirt road and got on the main road. And since he'd been to town, there was a sign up there that said speed limit 35. He'd never seen a speed limit sign in his life. Speed limit 35. He looked at Betsy pulling that wagon. He looked at that sign. He looked back at Betsy. He said, old Betsy, I don't know if we can do it that good. I don't know if we can take it that fast. But he said, I'm going to lay the whip on you and we're going to try. So today, we'll just lay the whip on and try. I don't know if I can go 35, but we'll, we'll try. Amen. Let's read from uh, Philippians chapter number 3. Some beautiful uh, reading of the word of the Lord. Uh, verse number 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven. One version says our citizenship is in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So today I want to talk to you from these verses and others. And for the sake of a text, I will use the scripture of verse 18, where Paul said, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So my subject today is enemies of the cross of Christ. I want you to um, lay your Bible down if you would. And I want Brother Young to come back up, up here if he would and pray for us. Let's pray that the anointing of God would touch us in these next few moments. Praise God. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that our hearts would be open, our minds receptive, our spirits to hunger for the truth that is to be preached. We prepare our spirit to receive your word. Grant it, Lord, that your presence would touch us today. Help us to be changed and different when we leave. Now we praise you for the word we're about to receive. Young people, lift your voice and praise the Lord one more time. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody said praise the Lord. Thank you for standing. You may be seated and God bless you. The Bible said in Colossians 1 and verse 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Notice, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. When I felt uh, impressed of God in the last few weeks of studying and praying for this message, I felt to talk some about the cross. And I realize it's not a popular subject. The devil hates preaching about the cross. The devil hates preaching about the blood. The devil hates preaching about the deity of Jesus Christ. But since we're not here to please the devil today, we're here to please the Lord. I think we ought to just open our hearts for a while and let God touch us. Amen. When you, when you speak of the cross, you're speaking of burden, of sacrifice, of humiliation, of suffering, of shame, and oft times reproach. 
Jesus said, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to set a, a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. How true that is. Your enemies or foes will oftentimes be those of your own house and those that are closest to you. He that loveth father or mother, notice how he worded this, more than me. There's got to be the full commitment to Jesus Christ. When you come to him, you hold nothing back in reserve. He said, if you love your father and mother more than me, you are not worthy of me. And he that loveth his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And notice, and he that taketh not his cross. Everybody say his cross. And followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, first of all, we start out talking about the cross of Christ. And then Jesus lets us know there's going to be the transferal of that cross at some point, And you and I are going to have a cross to bear. He said, he that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Again, he said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother. Obviously, he was not talking about hate in the sense of vehement dislike. But he's talking about the word hate is loves less. He that cometh to me and loves me less than his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross, everybody say his cross. Everybody that dares not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then another case, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Living for God is to a great extent learning self-discipline and denying of the flesh. Amen. He said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then he follows that with a question for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter eight said when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever, that's anybody, that's everybody, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. I'm simply trying to establish in the first few moments of this message today that there is the bearing of a cross. There is a cross to be borne by you and I at some point in our life. And we're not trying to scare anybody away. We want to tell you that living for God is the greatest life in all the world. When young people live for God, it's the greatest life you could ever live. There's nothing else that can compare with this. Praise God. I got the Holy Ghost when I was 15 years old, baptized in Jesus' name. Haven't been a perfect angel ever since then, but I've stayed in the church ever since that experience at the age of 15. Now I want to tell you today that it's a good life living for the Lord. Amen. Madisonville, Kentucky years ago, the church where Brother Jimmy Russell pastored, there was a, an old gentleman that would get up and testify. And every time he'd testify, he had rather high voice. I was there preaching one night and he got up and he said, Saints, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Amen. Rusty Goodman across town heard about it, wrote a song, became po quite popular later. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. But that's the way I feel today about living for God. 
That's the way I felt in my teen years. That's the way I felt in my 20s. That's the way I felt in my early married life. I still feel that way today. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Praise God. You may be seated. And yet in all the good times we enjoy and the peace and the love and joy and happiness, all the blessings of God that we enjoy every day, we're not going to stand here and try to deceive anybody and say if you live for God, it's going to be smooth sailing and you'll never have a trial and you'll never be tested and you'll never be tempted and everything's going to be right all the time. You're going to have a million dollars and a carload of spending money. I'm not going to tell you that this morning, but I will tell you that after all the flood that he talked about last night, we're still going to shout in the storm. We're still going to shout in the rain. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life, Jesus said, for my sake and the gospels, he shall save it. Amen. Coming to God is losing something, but it's gaining a whole lot more than you lost. And anything you lost by coming to God, you didn't need it anyhow. It was not for your good anyhow. It was not for the furtherance of your salvation anyhow. Praise God, praise God. I'm talking to a bunch of young people today that I can tell you're committed to God and the truth of the gospel. You're committed to serving the Lord and God's not going to fail you. He will not let you down in your darkest hour of disappointment. Hallelujah. There was a man that came to Jesus talking about how to get eternal life. And Jesus beholding him loved him and said to him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell what thou hast, give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross. It looked like to me every time Jesus taught for a little while, to the young, he, he came back to the cross, came back to the idea of the cross. He said, take up the cross and follow me. The man was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Luke 9 tells us that the scripture says the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them in that same context of scripture if any man come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me first of all we're talking about the cross of christ then we're talking about as you repent of your sins and you're baptized in the wonderful name of jesus christ for the remission of your sins and God fills you with the Holy Ghost. And you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Then it becomes a cross for you to bear. He talks about the cross of Christ. He talks about the cross in a general sense. Then he brings it home and says, you've got to take up your cross. And then he nails it down just a little bit tighter. He said, you've got to take up your cross daily. Daily. You don't live for God just on Sunday. You don't live for God just at peak. You don't live for God just when you go in the doors of your church house. Hey, young people, we live for God seven days a week. There's a cross to bear, and it's a daily cross. But great will be your reward, and great will be your spiritual dividends. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise him. Hallelujah. 
You may be seated. And, and they led Jesus away to crucify him. And the Bible said, as they came out, Matthew 27, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him, this was interesting to me, him they compel to bear his cross. Here was a man that had just been the city. Perhaps he'd been there a few days, taking care of business or whatever, and he was on his way back home. He was walking by, and uh, about this time, they're getting ready to crucify Jesus. And they said, hey, you, you, me? Yeah, Simon, you, you come and bear his cross. Why should I bear his cross? He may not have even known who it was. There were crucifixions all the time in those days. He may not have understood the great power and the glory of the man who was going to be nailed to that cross. He may not have understood that this is God manifest in the flesh. This is the express image of the invisible God. This is God's body. This is God's person. This is all of God you'll ever see. It's in the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm glad I preached to young people today that believe there is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism, and there's one God and Father of all, who's above all, who's through all, and who's in you all. Do you believe it? Shout yes. Shout yes, somebody. Let's clap our hands. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. So sometimes we may be like Simon. We may be compelled to bear a cross that we really didn't ask for. We really didn't want it. But we got to bear that cross. Amen. That cross may be a financial loss. That cross may be the loss of a job. That cross may be a sickness or an accident. That cross may be a death in the family. Sometimes crosses come to us very unexpectedly. Amen. And we're called upon to bear crosses in times and situations that we may not understand. But remember that all things work together for the good to them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. Any cross that you're called on to bear, even if it's an unexpected cross like Simon bore, then let's bear up under it and say, God will give me grace. God's grace is sufficient. God will never allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. But in every temptation, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. How many know that God's going to help you? How many have had some experience that God's on your side? And if God be for us, then who can be against us? Living for God is not for the selfish, those that are seeking self-aggrandizement. Living for God is not for those that are just simply and always thinking of themselves. Somebody said a man wrapped up in himself makes a small package. And a person that's wrapped up in himself cannot share himself with other people. And only Jesus Christ can deliver us from selfishness and open our eyes that we may see the needs of other young people about us. Amen. I said there's young people in this building that are soul winners. There's others that have not been before now, but when you go home from Pete 2012, you're going to become a soul winner. I could feel it in this conference. I could feel it since I've been here. Amen. Some have talked about buses and vans and reaching out and, and, and getting 32 people to ride to church. I want to tell you, there is a potential that has not been unleashed yet. In, in apostolic young people that if we ever find out who we are and what we've got and be bold in the Holy Ghost we're going to go out of here and share this wonderful truth with everybody we can Amen 
I talked to a young lady in a restaurant where we were checking out yesterday. She said, uh, what's going on here? So we told her and invited her to church. She said she was coming last night. I hope she came. I hope she got the Holy Ghost. Amen. We went by a little yogurt place yesterday and picked up a little yogurt. And the young man said, why are you all dressed up here in the middle of the day? 102 degrees. Amen. I said, man, we're having church. He said, where? I told him. He said, could I come? Looked to be 20 years old. He said, could I come? I said, you can come. There's no charge. He said, I can't come tonight, but I'll come Friday night. Amen. That's tonight. Tonight's his Holy Ghost night. Don't tell me that no one wants God. We've got a message. We've got a name. We've got a word. We've got a power. We've got an anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Talking about selfishness, I was reading a poem the other day, and it said, it's entitled, A Tea Party for Me. And it said, I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests in all. Just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. It was also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. Now that's just about the way some folks are. They're wrapped up in themselves. But God's looking for some young people that'll come out of hiding, out of your shell, out of the misconception that you can't reach others, out of the misconceived idea that young people can't be used of God. God's going to raise up some young people and is already doing it. Amen. In the apostolic ranks today, that's going to make a profound impact on our generation. Amen. Jesus was talking about in Matthew 27 and 40. And he said, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. This was the cry that was given then. That cry is the same today. What good is the cross? Why do we need a cross? There's an easier way. Just simply join a church. Sign a card. Shake hands for the preacher. Make a public confession. Walk the aisle. Walk the Roman road, which happens to not exist. Amen. I'd rather walk the Jerusalem road than the Roman road any day. By the way, let me tell you, Romans 10 was not written to tell people how to be saved. That was written to people that were already baptized in Jesus' name, Romans 6. They already had the Holy Ghost, Romans 8. Hey, young people, you don't have to take a back seat to this message. It'll stand up anywhere, anytime, any place with anybody. Amen. You may be seated, but a lot of folks are saying, why well, make a big deal about it? It's no big deal. Just join the church and, and so on. Amen. And a lot of folks are not saying, uh, I hate Jesus. They're not saying, I don't like Jesus. In fact, they're saying, I love Jesus. But it's the stigma of the cross that they don't like. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 1, for the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. A lot of people in our day are singing songs. And they're saying, I love Jesus. Singing songs about Jesus. Preaching sermons about Jesus. They're witnessing to others about Jesus. However, there's still the refusal in their life to take up the cross and follow him. And what they're looking for in many cases is a carefree religion, a pain-free religion, a religion that offers no commitment and no sacrifice and no bearing of any cross. Hallelujah. But I come to you today with a message on my heart to tell you, that the cross is something that all of us have got to get under at times. But brother, the end result, it's going to make the pain worthwhile. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what Paul said in Galatians 6? He said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross. I'm going to glory 
in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul boldly said, I am dead to this world. I am dead to its carnal desires. I'm dead to its wishes and its will. I'm dead to its sinfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We need young people in the apostolic church tonight, that, today that says, I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the carnal things of this world. I'm dead to my past. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 4, Paul said, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, notice in patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of the truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. Hallelujah. Some people will try to dishonor you, but God's going to honor you. Some people say you're not known, but you're well known in heaven. You've got a good record where it counts. Amen. He said as, as, as unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. He said sorrow comes and trouble comes and reverses come and heartache and setback comes. But he said we're always rejoicing. Always rejoicing. Don't go to your church this weekend and sit there with your head down. Walk in there with the anointing of God. Fresh from a youth convention and say, I have victory in my life. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. Paul said, we're sorrowful, but yet always rejoicing. We're poor, but we're making many rich. We don't have much, but we're getting the riches of the gospel to many as having nothing and yet possessing all things. I like that paradoxical statement made by Paul. He said, you have nothing, but really you have all things. When the world comes to us and they try to tell us for the meals, I'm gonna offer you what what we've got to offer and we say i'm sorry i've already got everything the world can't offer you anything because he said you already have you possess all things when they come and try to take away from you what you got you say i don't have anything when they say we'll give you what we got you say i'm sorry i already have everything <laughs> the world can't understand the christian don't try to figure it out faith it out the world don't understand God's people. The world don't understand young people that'll come to church on Friday and shout and talk in tongues and go out of here and live for God. But I'm telling you, you are God's church. You are God's people. You are the apple of his eye. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But now in Christ Jesus, you sometime were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, not to make, uh, for to make of himself of twain one new man, so uh, making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Somebody say the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, therefore, here's who you are. You are no more strangers and you are no more foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God.
the Bible declares that whether you are Jew or Gentile, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Hallelujah. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you've got your sin permitted. If you've got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, you've been born again of water and spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got a right to shout. You've got a right to praise the Lord. All of this is possible by the cross. Then Paul writes, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Notice, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now Paul talks about weights and he talks about sins. And he talks about the sin that would easily beset us. What is the besetting sin? What is the sin that's trying to make inroads into your life? Is it playing on organized sports? Hallelujah. Is it dating someone that's not in the church? Is it a bad attitude toward your pastor? Are, are you a youth pastor? Let me tell you something. There can be weights and besetting sins that can come our way. But we've got to run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I said, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Somebody wrote a song, and I, I used to hear it some. And it says, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. It's easy to say I love Jesus. It's easy to wear a religious chain around your neck. It's easy to wear a chain around your neck or, or maybe uh, uh, have a Jesus t-shirt on that says, I belong to Jesus. That's pretty easy. I've seen bumper stickers that said, honk if you love Jesus. Amen. I thought about having a, my own bumper sticker fixed up. Instead of saying, honk if you love Jesus, I thought about putting one on my car that said, tithe if you love Jesus. Amen. Yeah. I was like pulling behind the car and it said, uh, tithe if you love Jesus. Anybody can honk. <laughs> Amen. But that's what the world is doing. Uh, and they're trying to fit us into a mold of a modernistic viewpoint of Pentecostalism that, that I don't know anything about. I'm going to tell you that God's going to have a church. Jesus taught that the cross will divide you sometime from your family and sometime from your friends and sometime from father and mother. Amen. It'll separate you from worldly habits and carnal and sinful desires. When you begin to bear your cross, then you become dead to the world. You become dead to sin and the world becomes dead to you. Hallelujah. Cross bearing in our generation is not popular. Even in the days of Jeremiah the prophet, he asked Israel the question, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Answer, nay or no. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Uh, not only did they sin, uh, and, and did their sin not bother them anymore, but they actually persecuted God's man for bringing a message of hope and deliverance to them. Let us not be surprised at the pressures that's put on in this end time. And the effects of sin will try to make an inroads into your life. But tonight, today, it's time for us to lift up our voices in triumphant praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Exhort one another while it's called today, lest any of you, not written to sinners, but any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This was to Christians and the admonition is clear. Number one, be careful. Number two, sin deceives you. Number three, sin hardens your heart. 
And many people in our day are getting used to the filth of this world. We cannot become adjusted to this world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We cannot become used to the filth and the degradation and the awfulness of, of the sinful conditions of our day. Let me tell you, originally, you may be seen, originally, the theme of dirty magazines was nudity. And soon, sex sins began and scenes began to appear in their magazines. From there, such magazines have unashamedly shown bestiality, homosexuality, teen porn, kiddie porn. And I was reading just the other day where many in America are involved in baby porn. Children less than 10 months old. Baby pornography. Somebody's got a sickness in our day. Somebody needs some help. And the apostolic church is not going to sit in the corner and wait on the world to do that thing. We're going to step out and say, we've got an answer. I said, we've got an answer. The church has got an answer. Your pastor's got an answer. You young people have got an answer. Let's take that answer to our world. Amen. I was reading an article where someone said, the things that will destroy us is politics without principle. It's pleasure without a conscience. It's wealth without work. It's knowledge without character. It's business without morality. It's science without humanity. And it's worship without a sacrifice. There's got to be some sacrifice on your part and mine. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? I'll say it again, and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. There was a time in days gone by when abortion was a blight on our society. But now we're being told it's an intelligent alternative to having unwanted children. Amen. And many young people in our generation are left with the question, who am I? Who, why, how'd I get here? Am I just a mistake? Am I just uh, here because my mom forgot to the, take the pill? Is that who I am? I want to rise up in the midst of this generation and tell some young people today, there's a better and more noble calling of your purpose to be on this earth. <laughs> young people, when you go back to your town, your community, and your church, let your light shine. <laughs> the Bible said, Genesis 8, the imagination of men's hearts were evil continually. Are from their youth. Proverbs 14 said, There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof the ways of death. Jeremiah 17 9 said, The heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So man's sense of right and wrong is becoming so warped by sin and the flesh that they cannot properly decide between right and wrong. Man needs a standard, and God has given us a standard, and that standard is the Word of God. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for his word. Psalms 119 verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 119 and 128. That, listen to this. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts. All thy precepts. Concerning all things to be right. David said, I consider all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Then he concluded by saying, I hate every false way. The church doesn't hate people. We hate sin that has people bound and immersed in carnality and sinful living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible said in Proverbs 3.32 that the froward is abomination of the Lord. 
Amen. But his secret is with the righteous. In 11 and 20, a proverb said, They that are of a forward heart are an abomination of the Lord, but such as are upright in the way are his delight. According to Strong's Concordance, the word forward means perverse, deceitful, and crooked. Let me tell you, sin is still sin. Wrong is still wrong. And I'm going to be a little old-fashioned today and say whatever was a sin five years ago is still a sin this morning. Whatever was a sin 30 years ago is still a sin today. You can have all your modern powerless dead religion, but I want the glory of God. And the glory of God is going to be among a people who honor and obey His Word. Somebody worship God with me right now. Somebody said hallelujah. You may be seated. Proverbs 6, I'll move quickly. Uh, Makes a a, a distinction here in these verses concerning certain sins. And the first six are, and the first six things he mentioned, Proverbs 6, 16, uh, uh, are things that God hates. The seventh one, steps a little further it has the added distinction of being an abomination six things god hates the seventh is an abomination so from the context of this passage we've got to conclude that worse than a lion tongue is he that soweth discord among the brethren worse than feet that are that run to mischief is he that sowed discord among brethren Worse than hands that shed innocent blood is he that sows discord among the brethren. Let us remember this morning and this afternoon now that the teaching of, of, of the word of God, God has given you a pastor. God has given you a shepherd over your local church to give guidance, to give wisdom, to give counsel, to give understanding that we may be followers of God as dear children. The Apostle Paul said, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, whose teachings or doctrine follow. He also said, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself, for they watch for your soul. Let me tell you, young people, you'll never outgrow your need of a shepherd, of a pastor. I don't care what the world is saying. There are many voices out here in the world, but you need to hear what the man of God is saying in the pulpit. And anybody that makes a conscious choice not to hear the words of the man of God is making a decision that could well cost them their soul. When it comes to what is right and what is wrong, here's what I'm hearing in my day. I'm not convicted about it. You ever hear that? I'm not convicted about it. Or, you folks are a bunch of legalists. Do you ever hear that? Or, they say, I have liberty in Christ, therefore I can do anything I want to do. Or, some of them say, I don't worry about all that stuff about righteousness and living for God. I only worry about the essentials. Who decides what's essential? Let me tell you that if it's in the word of God, it's not there by accident. If it's in the word of God, we've got an obligation to obey the word of God. And God's word is forever established and settled in heaven. For I'm the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Since God has not changed, what was an abomination 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 years ago is still an abomination to God today. Amen. Maybe may be seated. We have an interesting, I think a rather sad phenomenon in apostolic circles today. It's trying to encroach itself into our churches. Apostolic churches, a mass exodus of people are leaving apostolic churches around the country because of standards for living. Many preachers now are preaching that standards of righteousness and truth is only a matter of personal conviction. In other words, if you think 
something is wrong, then it's wrong for you. But if you think it's all right, then it's all right for you. I've talked to more than one pastor in recent months that said, I really pastor two congregations. My middle-aged and older folk are living a certain way and my young people are living another way. Thus, when you walk in their church, the older folk look pretty good. Women have long uncut hair. No makeup. The absence of jewelry. The ladies wear dresses, not pants. But if you look at the young people in those churches, they got their hair cut, they're wearing makeup, they're going to ball games, they're going to movies. And a lot of churches have dismissed Sunday night service and the young people and young couples are heading to the movies. If you want to dismiss Sunday night, that's your business. Amen. But I still want the house of God. I need the house of God. I need every service I can get. I said, I need every service I can get. I need Sunday morning. I need Sunday night. I need a weeknight service. Young people, don't stay home. Stand by your pastor. Be faithful. Hallelujah. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Maybe see when folks walk in our church, they ought to see the same standard in the young people as they see in the middle-aged older folks. It all looked the same. Numerous pastors say, well, when they ask, what do you believe? They'll say, look at my wife. Okay, you can look at my wife. She's right over here. She's my sweetheart, 49 years. And uh, you can look at my wife, but I'm telling you something. That doesn't tell you how the whole church is going just to look at my wife. Somebody said, if you want to know what my church is like, just look at my platform. Hey, I'm not just interested on in the choir being saved. I'm not just interested in my youth crowd going to heaven. I'm interested in everybody in the pews going to heaven. You may be seated. If you sing in the choir, I don't sing in the choir. You still got to live for God. If you sing a special or you don't sing a special, you still got to be committed to God. If you play music or if you don't play music, you still got to obey the gospel. God don't have one standard for the platform and another standard for the back seat. Come on, you folks in the cheap seats up here, high up in the cheap seats, praise God. you got to obey the same word that these good folks do on this platform. I understand we need a clean platform, but it don't need to stop right here. It needs to go back in the pews. Somebody worship God with me now. If it's a sin for my choir members, ladies, to cut their hair, it's a sin for the ladies in the pew to cut their hair. I'm interested in everybody in that building going to heaven you can be seated or stand it doesn't matter to me I'm coming to a close Paul said one chapter two times he said and finally my brother so I guess I can say it twice. And finally, my brethren, praise God. And one little boy was in the church and the preacher was preaching on Sunday morning, finally closed his Bible. Little boy punched his daddy and said, what does that mean when he closes the Bible? He turned to him and said, it don't mean a thing. 
Amen. He's still going to preach. I want to tell you something. We've got an interesting thing going on. Preachers are preaching. If you want to, it's all right. National radio and TV preachers and even local churches are denouncing everybody that preaches standards. They're calling them legalists. A well-known preacher from California recently cried out. I was told I didn't see it on television. And he said, I hate legalism. He was referring to those that preach about standards for living. Another preacher chided those in the congregation for making a big deal over regional convictions. Regional convictions. What region do you live in? Amen. What's good for the south is good for the north. What's good for the east is good for the west. I don't believe we have regional convictions. I believe everybody ought to have some good Bible-based strong convictions. Predicated on the Word of God. I went to preach for a preacher up north one time. And I was evangelizing. And he said, now let me tell you something, son. I was younger then. He said, let me tell you something. Up north here, we don't shout. We don't scream, we don't holler, we don't run the aisles. Now you Southerners, y'all, y'all can do it. But he said, up here, we don't do it. He said, we don't go to the altar and cry. We don't shed tears in the altar. So don't be trying to get folks in the altar and getting them a crying and shedding tears. He said, we want to keep it uh, like it is. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, when we folks from the North or uh, South, when we from the South, when we sit down on a pen that's in our chair, you know what we say? We say, ouch! Sit down on a pen. And I guess you folks from the North, when you sit down on a pen, you say, my goodness. It seems that something is protruding the backside of my pen. No, I tell you what you folks from the north do. You do just like we do. You say, yeah. You know what? When folks get the Holy Ghost in the south, they speak in tongues. When they get it in the north, they speak in tongues. When they get it in the west, they speak in tongues. When they get it on the east coast, they speak in tongues. If I'm against something that they're not against, then I'm branded as a legalist. Legalism has become the compromiser's excuse to circumvent the Word of God. A phrase that's often used by those who think right and wrong is simply a matter of personal choice. They say this, I'm not convicted about it yet. In their opinions, standards are only a matter of personal conviction. When I look out over this beautiful audience, and I see young people that love God, and we've got a good group from Durham over here, and they're praying for me. And uh, I'm going to tell you that it's not just a matter of personal convictions. It's a matter of biblical principle. Hallelujah. Righteousness didn't become personal convictions when I came to God, got baptized, got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. God's word says what it does, regardless of your convictions and regardless of mine. Some of them say we're not under law, but we're under grace. I got a question for you. Paul asked the question, shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? His answer was God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? When a person comes to God, God doesn't throw this book, the Bible, out the window and says, now that you're a Christian, you can do anything you want to do. Doesn't matter what I said about it in years gone by. Now then, you're free to live by your own conscience. And you must quit only what you want to quit and what you feel like is wrong. However, that type of thinking violates the Word of God 
and the righteousness of God's word. Amen. Is it legalism to say a Christian shouldn't tell a lie? Now, I'm going to close momentarily, but I got I got a few remarks I want to make. I'm not I'm I'm just here to preach. They asked me to preach. They didn't tell me what to preach, and I'm I don't believe in being hard and mean and nasty and bad spirited. I don't think we win people of God with a bad attitude and a bad spirit. You know what I think? I think your spirit can be absolutely right, and also your holiness can be absolutely right. Amen. I got folks from our church here today. Amen. They'll tell you, we're, we believe in wholeness. We believe in, in, in a lifestyle of Christian living and commitment. But we're not going to stop trying to reach people. Amen. This summer month since the 1st of June, we're averaging, I just say this to show you a point, we're averaging over 400 per Sunday on our buses. In the summertime. We started revival two weeks ago with Brother Rodney Betts, my son-in-law, and the first two weeks, just regular services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday, we've already had 20 to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're baptizing folks every service. So we don't have a bad spirit. We don't have a mean spirit. We don't have an ugly spirit. We don't have a nasty spirit, but we believe the word of God. We have no ax to grind and we don't have a bad spirit. But I ask you the question, is it legalism to say a Christian shouldn't lie? I went to a state one time somewhere between North and South Pole and I preached four nights and wanted me to come preach on evangelism. And I did, that's always been my heartbeat really. From the time I started preaching, every church of pastors been home missions from zero, starting zero up, including where we are now. And so, uh, uh, I went there to preach in our conversation one day. He said, brother, go there. I didn't go there and preach standards. I went there and preached evangelism. I preached soul winning. He said, brother, go there. He said, you and I have got two different concepts. And I said, really? This was just eat, eat lunch. And he's a good spirit and everything. He's well known. Call his name. And 95% of the people here would, would know the name. But um, he said, uh, my standards are different from yours. He said, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, some things that you say is wrong, I don't say is wrong. He said, you know what you're doing? He said, you're drawing lines. And I don't believe in drawing lines. I said, you don't. I said, okay, I called his first name. I said, uh, you don't believe in drawing lines. He said, absolutely not. I've quit it. I've stopped it. I'm not going to do it anymore. He ran several hundred in church, but he said, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to draw lines anymore. I said, okay. Can somebody smoke cigarettes singing in your choir? Come on, come on. He said, well, he liked to swallow his tomato with that one. He was eating lunch. He said, well, no. If they smoke, they can't sing in my choir. I said, aren't you drawing a line? I said, if somebody, and you know they're on drugs, you know they're a cocaine user, would you let them play music in your, on your platform? He said, no. I said, aren't you drawing lines? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can do what you want, but all... All the years I've been preaching, I've been pastoring now since this past May. I've been pastoring 50 years. And I'm preaching exactly now what I preached 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. You know, it's a wonderful thing when your message don't change. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, I'm still preaching, Brother Wilson, the same thing. And so are you. I know you. I know your past. I've known you for years. You're still preaching what you used to. It makes you feel good to know you haven't changed your message. You haven't changed the gospel. You haven't changed the word. He said, well, let's take sleeves, for example. He said, now you believe in wearing long sleeves. I said, I've never said the sleeves had to be right here. Now, I'm just going to talk for me. Is that all right? I've never said it in my life. Please have to be for here. Although since I was 18, 
I made a personal commitment to God. I wouldn't wear anything but a long sleeve shirt. So I haven't owned one since I was 18. Haven't worn one. Does that make me some kind of holy joke? No. But what I teach in our church, it ought to cover the elbow. It ought to cover the elbow. He said, I don't believe that. I said, okay. I said, all right. Would you accept the sleeve right here? He said, yeah. I said, would you accept it on the platform, for example, right here? He said, yeah. I said, okay. What about right up here? He said, no. I said, no. Would you accept sleeveless clothes? He said, no. I said, aren't you drawing a line? I said, you know what? The more I talk to you, the more I realize you draw just as many lines as I do. It's just a, a difference in where we're drawing. Hallelujah. You know what? I believe we got young apostolic people that want to live for God. You're not resisting standards. You're not resisting the word of God. You love it. I can tell it. You love it. You want it. You desire it. And your voice is preach to me, preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. When Moses said, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it's an abomination. Was that legalism? Is it legalism to preach against homosexuality? Is it legalism to say it's a sin for a Christian to commit homosexual acts? Is it all right to commit homosexual acts if a person is not convicted about it? Sin is sin. Whether you've got any convictions about it or not. God's word, both the Old and New Testament, is the final determining factor of right and wrong, regardless of your or my convictions. Now let me ask you a question. Was Paul a legalist? Paul, was he a legalist when he told women to adorn themselves in modest apparel? Somebody answer me. Was Paul a legalist? Somebody shout it out. When Paul said that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel, was he a legalist? Was Paul a legalist when he said it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Was Paul a legalist when he said that a woman's long hair was for her covering and was her glory? Was Paul a legalist when he told Timothy to flee the love of money and follow after righteousness, godless faith, love, patience, and meekness? Was he a legalist? No. Was Paul a legalist when he told the Colossians to put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication? No. Was Paul a legalist when he told the Ephesians that neither fornication, nor uncleanness, nor covetousness, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking should be named among them? Was he a legalist? No. Was Paul a legalist when he told the Corinthian church to turn the adulterer out of their church? Was he a legalist? No. Praise God. Let's be clear today, young people. We do not have to apologize for the verses on righteousness, truth, separation of the world, and holy. It's time that we come back to using all scripture for it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I am not a legalist. I am not a legalist, but I believe it matters what God's word says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Many folks say, I love Jesus, but I don't want the cross. Many look disdainfully upon the cross and upon the idea that they should bear the cross. It's not Jesus they say that they're opposed to, but rather the cross of Christ. Now, my text said... They are enemies of the cross of Christ. He did not say, Brother Smith, they are enemies of Jesus. He didn't say that. They're enemies of the cross. 
They're enemies of the cross. I've talked to you a little bit today how Jesus, Paul, and others felt about the cross. Many people say, I love Jesus, but I don't want this cross business. However, when the Holy Ghost is present in power, I'm telling you, spiritual hunger will arise, healing and joy is released, and the flame inside of us is fanned into a blaze, and our dying embers become alive. When I look around even Pentecostal churches today, it appears that Pentecost to a lot of people is becoming a stale concept, and many churches have intentionally turned their spiritual thermostats down, way below room temperature, in an, in an effort to be relevant and sophisticated. I don't believe we ought to check them at the door, see what kind of car they're driving before we let them in. Or where they live. Or how much money they have. God's going to send a revival if he has to go to the streets and the lanes and the highways and the byways and the hedges. If he has to go to the poor and the maimed and the sick and the halt and the withered. Hallelujah. I can't imagine one of this youth committee coming up here to preach at youth, a youth camp in, uh, in your district or area where you are, or in, a, in, in Peak. I can't imagine them getting them a little stool and setting it up here. Walk out of here with their blue jeans on. You say, what's wrong with blue jeans? Nothing. There's time and a place for everything. When I go work in the yard, I look like I'm working in the yard. But when you come to church, it's time to look like you came to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't imagine one of these preachers sitting on a stool, giving a little discourse, some little homiletical discourse and little speech. He's got tennis shoes on. He's got pants that have holes in the knees. They look shaded and wore out. It was made brand new that way. We used to wear them that way too. On the farm, but it wasn't because they're popular. The preachers are coming to the pulpit, shirt tail hanging out, jeans on, and giving their little speeches. And God's not within 50 miles of that. Hey, I got news for the crowd that says this is the umpire of the emerging church. You're way behind the time. The church has already emerged and got here. <laughs> Hallelujah. We wanted to fit in with the culture of our world so badly that we moved uptown. We reinvented our message and we remodeled our altars. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm for positive changes of reaching anybody any way we can that's right. But I fear that the fires on our altars are going out when we refuse to bear our cross. We invented a new type of religion. Today's version is rock and roll and rap. It's strobe lights and smoke machines. Preachers in blue jeans, casual dress codes, relaxed meeting times, cotton candy sermons. It's a it's sad day when we turn out Christianettes instead of Christian Christianettes. They walk out the door and light their cigarettes and go home and turn on their TV sets. And then they wonder where the power of God is. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
It's the dawning of a new day in America, they say. But it's the dumbing down of religion in America that I see. But let's remember that we're open to the Holy Ghost. And if we aren't willing to bear our cross, then our postmodern trendy worship service, it's going to be extremely boring. Has anyone noticed that something is missing? Looking around at your own church, is there anything missing? Is the Holy Ghost welcome? How long has it been since somebody gave a message in tongues and interpretation? How long has it been since somebody lingered at the altar and prayed for God's mighty power to fill their lives? How long has it been since sinners got under conviction, ran to our altar seeking the face of God? Are things becoming so regimented that God can't interrupt our program? I believe it's time to look beyond our slick facade and recover what's been misplaced before we lose a whole generation. I'm going to tell you, we're in serious danger in some areas of losing a generation. But we need preachers and young people that will stand up. Stand up for Jesus. We're in the same predicament. We're in the same predicament of the sons of the prophets that turned to Elisha for help. They were busy building their house when one of the men dropped his axe head in the Jordan River. He had lost his most valuable tool. He couldn't build without it. The man cried for help, of course, and Elisha supernaturally discerned where the axe head was submerged. Then Elisha caused the heavy iron tool there in the water to float to the surface. In our religious business, we must recognize that if we're not careful, we're going to lose the axe head. We're trying to build churches and build ministries without the one tool that can do the job. Maybe we thought we could use a cheaper substitute, but our lightweight imitations won't work. We may dress and perform like the hip tech-savvy 21st century Christians, but the question still remains, do we have the power of Pentecost? Are we dull and boring and helpless? I'm not talking about necessarily a purpose-driven church. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost anointed church. It's time for us to cry out for the power of God. Somebody in this building cry out for the power of God with me. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's everybody stand. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, all over this building, let's pray right now. We need God. We need God's help. We need God's anointing. We need God's power. We need God's glory. We need to reach out to our city, our town community. We need to run bus routes, van routes. We need to hand out church cards, pass out tracks, knock on doors. Come on, I feel the spirit of prayer in this place. Who wants that power? Who wants that anointing? Who wants that glory? Who wants that virtue? Who, who's willing to bear that cross? Come on, let's pray together today. Let's shake the foundations of hell with apostolic praying. Glory! God's talking to some young people. Bear your cross. Be involved. Lift up the name of Jesus. Love the truth. 
Stand behind your pastor. Love your church. Be committed in every way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let me ask you these remarks and I will turn it back to our leader. In Romans 8 and 1, was Paul a legalist when he said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? Was Paul a legalist in Romans 8 and 9? When he said, if any man have not spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Was Paul a legalist in Romans 10 when he said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved for I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Was Paul a legalist in Romans 12 when he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Was John a legalist when he said, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Was Paul a legalist when he said to avoid fornication, that every man have his own wife? Was Paul a legalist when he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation? Was Paul a legalist when he said, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and fear of God? Was Paul a legalist when he said, Come out from among them and be his separate, saith the Lord? Was the man of God a legalist when he said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes? Because the other writer said, Mine eyes affecteth my heart. Was Paul a legalist when he said, They that do the works of the flesh that he mentioned in Galatians 5 shall not... Inherit the kingdom of God. Was God a legalist when he said the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man? Neither should a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. Come on. Where are you young people? Where do you stand today? Somebody said, well, brother, go down and read on down verses 6 through 9, Deuteronomy 22. And it talks about cloths and animals and so on. Let me tell you very quickly that there were three, three laws as I see them. Number one, there were dietary laws that was just for Israel. There were ceremonial laws such as Sabbath and feast days and new moons that was nailed to the cross with Christ. And then there are moral laws. And moral laws will never change. The dietary laws may change. The ceremonial laws may not be needed after a while. But the moral laws never change. And God never said about the dietary laws that it would be an abomination to God. He never said the ceremonial laws, if you break them, it'd be an abomination. That's a strong word. But he said about the moral law, they that do so are an abomination to the Lord. One man told me one time, when you preach against uh, women wearing pants and, and you preach against makeup and cut hair, and men looking nice and Christian, holy and clean, then you're being a legalist. And I said, you mind I ask you a question? I said, what's the opposite of the word legal? Illegal. Illegal. I said, tell me, what's the opposite of it? He said, well, I guess illegal. I said, okay. Then if I'm a legalist, you're an illegalist. But the fact is, young people, we are not legalism. We are not legalists. We believe the Bible. We believe the Word of God. We believe in the old-fashioned principles of God's Word. 
I want everybody that wants to do the will of God, lift your hands with me.